I should like to call your attention this evening to one of the phrases that came in our reading at the beginning, namely the first phrase in the 13th verse of the first chapter of the first epistle of Peter. The first epistle of Peter, the first chapter, and the first phrase in the 13th verse. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, I'm sure that there may be some present in this congregation who are amazed and astonished to hear such a text, such a word, coming out of the Bible and being pronounced and proclaimed from a Christian pulpit. I say that because I know that the common idea with regard to the Christian faith, to the whole of Christianity, which is so popular today, is that uh, it is nothing but what is called sub-stuff, something purely emotional, and that most people who never go to a place of worship and who ridicule Christianity do so because they hold that particular view of it. That you can really only be a Christian if you stop thinking. If you jettison your intellect and your powers and capacities for thought and reason and consideration and abandon yourself to the mere realm of feeling and of emotion or into the realm of fancy and of fantasy. Now that is, as I think you'll all agree, a very common attitude towards Christianity and the Christian faith. People say that uh, they alone are Christians who are either unintelligent or else who for some peculiar reason do not use and imply their intelligence. Well now the answer to all that of course is our text this evening. Gird up the lines of your mind. And that isn't an isolated text in the scripture. I could give you many similar texts. Listen to an Old Testament prophet saying, Come, let us reason together. That's it. And I could give you countless other examples and illustrations of the same thing in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Indeed, I would make this claim. The Bible is a book which from beginning to end urges people to think to gird up the loins of their mind. Its whole case, as a matter of fact, is dependent upon that. The Bible says that all our troubles in life are ultimately due to the fact that we don't think, or else if we do, we are thinking incorrectly, with false premises, or have gone wrong somewhere in our argument. Its great appeal, I say, everywhere is what we read here, gird up the loins of your mind the rational faculty and power that you've got. Use it. Give it free scope. Bring it to play upon the only things that finally matter. Now, that's my first answer to this common prevailing attitude towards the Christian faith and the Christian message. But I've got a second, and it's this. I not only assert that the Bible urges us thus to think and to use our minds, I go further. And I say that it is the only thing in the world tonight that truly does so. That there is no other teaching facing the human race at this moment that really offers us the ability to think and to think clearly apart from this. Now then, I issue that as a challenge. There may be someone present who likes and who is anxious to, to query this. Very well, let's approach it like this. I think we'll all agree that all the acutest thinkers in this world this evening are agreed in saying that perhaps the most urgent and the most serious problem which is confronting the human race at this moment is the whole question of mankind's use of its mind. Let me use the popular current jargon. 
the greatest problem confronting the human race this evening is what is called the battle for the mind. Now, I want to make this clear. I am asserting that all acute thinkers are agreed about that. Now, whether they are Christian or not at this point doesn't matter at all. I could quote to you many names of men who are not Christians, who say they are not Christians, who have no use for Christianity at all, and who abominate Christianity. But they agree in saying that the greatest problem in the world at this very minute is the battle for the mind of man. Some of them are indeed so alarmed about this that they say that unless something happens in that very quickly, that the whole human race is doomed again to a return to some condition of unutterable slavery. And the world may find itself back in some dark era and period in its long history. Well, now then, why are they saying this? Why are they uh, concerned about this? Why are they alarmed? Well, the answer is that there are at work in the world at the present time various forces and influences which are doing their utmost to govern and to control the minds and the thinking of men and women to dragoon the thinking, to bludgeon the minds of people. So they argue that the greatest matter of moment at this present time is how to maintain the freedom of the mind. We are in an era when we are confronted by a veritable battle for the mind of man and the freedom of man's use of his mind. Well, now then, in what way is this true? What are these various forces and factors to which I have referred, which are in this way threatening the freedom of the mind? Now, let me mention some of them to you. I don't apologize for doing this. This is an essential part of the preaching of the gospel. Because, you see, it is my whole case, that's why I'm in this pulpit at all, to say that there is nothing that finally can win this battle for the mind and assure us freedom of thought but the Christian gospel. Now then, let's look at the position by which we are confronted. In what forms do these forces tend to cripple and fetter and enchain the mind of men? Well, I've classified them like this for the sake of convenience. There are certain ways in which this is being done quite, open, quite openly. What do I mean by that? Well, here are some of the open and deliberate ways in which this is being done. There are many, no doubt, present who are familiar with the term brainwashing. You've read of it. This is something that was practiced by Hitler in pre-war Germany and during the war in various countries that he conquered. Brainwashing. It is something that is being done by the communists. If you want to know more about it, you can find a, a paperback to book, uh, on the bookstalls with the very title Brainwashing by an American called Edward Hunter. Read it. If you want another, you can read a book like, you may be amazed to hear me quoting him, I'm simply asking you to read him in order you, that you may discover the facts. Mr. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World Revisited. There you'll find all about it. Well, what, what do they say? Well, this is what is happening. You've read about this in the papers, how men are taken and put into prisons and concentration camps. Then they are deliberately underfed in order that their physical resistance may weaken and go down. They're not allowed to sleep sufficiently. They're disturbed. They're kept awake, perhaps, night after night with a blaring light shining down upon them. And in this weakened physical condition and with this awful light blazing upon them, these uh, authorities come and they break down their resistance. They ridicule what these people have always believed and... They keep on at this, and then they introduce them to their doctrine, whether it's fascism or Nazism or communism, it doesn't matter. And they go on and on and on until these poor people, these poor victims, in sheer physical exhaustion, break down, they collapse. And then the new doctrine is put in. And so you read in a few months that at a public trial... A man of integrity, a man of character, gets into a witness box and he says, everything I'd said previously was a lie. 
I withdraw it all, I recant. And he now proclaims this new teaching. You've been reading about that. That's called brainwashing. Well, now there's one of the ways in which directly an attack is being made upon the mind and the power of thinking. I'm just noting these things in passing. Another way, of course, in which it's done is by means of advertising and propaganda. Surely there's no need to elaborate this point. Are we not all victims of advertising and of propaganda? Most of the things we eat because we've been told by many advertisements to do so. We dress because of the advertisements. All our life is being controlled by very subtle and by very, very clever advertising. And have you heard the term which is used, build up? There was some sort of a musical comedy or whatever it may be called. It's still on in London. I remember reading at the time, long before, months before, the thing ever came. All the seats were sold out for over a year. Why? Well, this build up. The impression was being given almost every day. This was going to be the most marvelous thing that had ever happened in London. Everybody said we must go there. Well, you see, they were being influenced by the advertising, the propaganda. That isn't thought. That's being influenced, your mind being controlled by these powers that are anxious to build up something and to get you to go in for it. Advertising and propaganda. It's astounding the effect it has. Consult the statistics about how a 29-second, I believe, advertisement on the television can cause the sales of a commodity to rocket up almost to incredible heights. That's advertising and propaganda, influencing people's thinking and thought in a direct manner. There's just one other I want to mention. Are you familiar with what is called subliminal advertising? It's a very subtle thing and a very dangerous thing. It means this. You may be seated in a cinema and you're looking at a screen. Well, while you're looking at that screen and something else, something is just flashed onto the screen for a second. You, you really didn't see it. At least you're not aware of the fact that you saw it, but you did see it. Then sometimes uh, an expression is made. You actually didn't hear it consciously, but you did hear it. Subliminal. It's beneath the level of consciousness, but it gets there. A thought, an idea, it's flashed and you're not aware that anything's happening. And so it's done so frequently that it begins to control your whole mind and your whole outlook. And you're not aware that it's happening. Well, there, for me to hurry on, are some of the ways in which this is done openly and deliberately. But look for a moment at some of the ways in which it's done much more insidiously and in a kind of secondary manner. Think of the very society in which we are living, the so-called mass society to which we belong. Do we realize that even that discourages thought? Look how we live in cities and in crowds. All that is discouraging to thought. You can't be in a crowd and be as free in your brain as you were when you were alone. There is a mass mentality, a mob psychology. It's a very familiar fact. There is no question about it at all. The individual becomes lost in the crowd and in the mass. And unconsciously, he begins to shout with everybody else. He hadn't thought it out because everybody's shouting, so he shouts. Our very mass society is discouraging to individuality and individual thinking. And then, look at the way in which everything's being organized. Now, there's a sense in which a lot of this is good, but it is harmful from the standpoint of the mind, the welfare state. Everything's being done for us. So because it's being done, I don't have to think about it. So it's discouraging thought. A new term has come in during the last 18 months. I find it coming in more and more. We, we read about social engineers. Social engineers. These are the men who engineer our social life and activity. Everything's organized. Even our pleasures are organized. Men used to make their own pleasures, invent their own games and play themselves. They don't now. They sit in thousands at a time just watching a few people doing something. It's the mass, the mob mentality. They're not thinking. It's all being done for us. Everything is being done for us. We are being catered for in every respect. And the more we are catered for, the less we think of ourselves. There's another myth. And then, of course, the very busyness and stress and strain and fatigue of life tends to do the same thing. The modern man is much too busy. Ah, but you say he doesn't work as long hours as he used to. I know. But you see, he works so hard at his pleasures. 
Pleasure is no longer relaxation. It's always excitement, always taking out of a man, not allowing him to relax and to get a little relief. No, no. It's, he's so busy in everything he does. And the result is, you see, that he's too tired to think. This isn't my opinion. The librarians of the country are telling us constantly that people are reading less and less and less. They used to read big books. They haven't got time now, they say. I just haven't got time. I'd like to read tremendously, says the man, but you know, I really haven't got the time. And he can't even read his newspaper. They're becoming smaller and more tabloid. He can only look at the headings, and he gets headings flashed on a screen or coming across the news. Listen to the headlines, turn off. We've no time, you see. We've no time. Well, of course, you see how this is working. It means that we think less. Our thinking is prescribed. It's given to us in a tabloid form. We accept it without knowing exactly why we should accept it. Here is a very dangerous tendency at the present hour. Then when you add to this what I would call the worship of the expert, you see how dangerous it becomes. There is a very real danger of our becoming slaves of the experts. This kind of thing. Take all this business of sending up rockets to the moon, splitting atoms, doing these extraordinary things, all that's being done by the physicists. Well, the average man says, I really don't begin to understand it. Who am I to understand things like this? So he deliberately stops thinking. And the physicist becomes an authority, a kind of mystery man. He has the power of the priest in the Middle Ages, and even more so, he's the medicine man, he, he, he's the genius he can do things and nobody understands, so we tend to bow down in worship. And any pronouncement made by such a man, we accept it automatically. It's not only true of the physicists. It's becoming increasingly true in the realm of medicine. With all these new drugs and all these new investigations, people say, well, I can't possibly begin to understand this. Well, medicine was comparatively simple. The patient felt he had a right to ask certain questions and be given an explanation. He felt that he was in a position to decide whether he'd have that or not, this operation or that treatment. But nowadays it's all so involved, so ultra-scientific, so specialized. Why the poor man feels that he doesn't begin to understand and he's got nothing to do but to submit to the expert. And I could illustrate this along many different lines. It is an obviously increasing tendency. The average ordinary man just feels bewildered and baffled by the immensity of it all and by these abstruse terms and categories he's given up thinking. And he's allowing the expert to say almost anything he likes and to dictate almost anything that he chooses. There's another. And then let us add to this the strain and the uncertainty of life. Two world wars, international tension. What's going to happen? Who can understand? Isn't it all bewildering? Conferences coming and going, not succeeding. And again, the average man feels that he just doesn't know. And he gives up thinking, therefore, and says, well, I can't be bothered with it all. I must leave it to those who are responsible. So that, again, tends to work in the same direction. Well, now, there's another great category, another great group. But listen to another. The wrong views that are current with respect to man and his nature and his being tends to lead in the same direction. Is man only an animal? Is man nothing more? Even if you call him a reasoning animal. He's still an animal. Well, very well. What's the point of his worrying too much about everything? If he's here today and gone tomorrow, that's the end of the story. Well, make the best of it while you're here and don't bother your head too much about possibilities. That's how it works. A debased view of men discourages thinking. Then there are those, you see, who explain men in a purely biological manner. Man, they say, what is he? Oh, he's nothing but the result of the interaction of various ductless glands. That determines personality, that determines character, that determines opinion. Well, if that is so, why bother to think? And then there is the, what I would call today almost the medical view of men. Haven't you noticed it creeping in? Everything's explained away in terms of disease. There'll be no crime quite soon. It'll all be disease. So you'll need no police courts. It'll... 
The doctors will make a pronouncement and that'll be the end of it. This medical view is coming in increasingly. Well, you may smile at this. I regard it as a very serious matter. I read a very learned article about 18 months or so ago in which a man set out to prove that uh, you can explain the politics of the last 30 years quite easily on medical grounds. They say, why did the late Mr. Neville Chamberlain, for instance, allow himself to be fooled as he was at Munich and at other places? And the man writing the article said, it's quite simple. The cancer which finally killed him had already started in him. The process was there. It was this incipient cancer. You see, there's a purely medical explanation. In other words, you mustn't judge statesmen by their activities, their actions, their statements, and what happens. You really need a medical report, and that's all you need. Well, there you are. The same thing was said about President Roosevelt and what he did at Yalta. It was this condition of his arteries which finally killed him. There may be some truth in it. All I'm saying is this, that you, if you exalt all this and you describe man and explain him solely in terms of physical or biological conditions, you are virtually suggesting that there's not much point in thinking. And I could expand this. There are other views of men, the behaviorist view, these various psychological views. They all, I say, work in exactly the same direction. Then add one other factor, and you'll see how everything that is happening today is discouraging mind and thought and freedom of thinking. Here is the last thing that I would adduce. It's this. The modern views as regards conduct and morals. As I've already suggested, the whole notion of morality is rapidly disappearing. And we are told that a man behaves as he does because he happens to be born like that. So he's not responsible. So there's no point in thinking. Everything is explained thus in terms of constitution, abnormality, or disease. And indeed there are those, and they, some of them are in great professorial positions as philosophers. You can hear them speaking on the brain trust very frequently, who rarely dismiss the whole notion of morals and more or less say that a man should do what he wants to do and feels like doing. And there it is. He's got these powers within him. Why shouldn't he use them and exercise them? Let him get rid of the shibboleths of the past and really live and express himself. Well, in other words, the encouragement is to stop thinking, not to use your mind. Now then, what is the result of all this? Well, it is, as I'm saying, less and less thought. Less and less meditation. Less and less really pondering and considering. Man himself, the meaning of life, the great issue, Death itself, and what lies beyond. All these forces and factors are playing upon us and round and about us, with the result, I say, that the average person today doesn't even try to think. The philosophy is, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. What's the use of bothering about it all? And you see, the pace of life is so tremendous. People are tired and exhausted, and they resort to drugs. They have to take drugs to make themselves sleep at night because they've been in so much excitement until they went to bed. Instead of doing their work in a healthy manner, going home and relaxing and going to bed and sleeping. The, the excitement, the pleasure has been stimulating them the whole time. They can't sleep. They take drugs. And then because they've taken the sleeping drug at night, they have to take another to rouse them and to keep them alert in the morning. And on and on it goes. Well, all right. It's, there is an aspect in which it's amusing, but you know I'm describing the majority of people in this country today. I could give you statistics to prove what I'm saying. These are sheer, hard facts. Men and women are taking drugs. Others turn to alcohol because of the stress and the strain and the anxiety and the concern. And, of course, the more you take drugs, whether it be alcohol or any other drug, the more is the effect upon your mind. The mind isn't as free as it was. It isn't as alert as it was. It isn't as able as it was to perform its task. Well, now then, there is modern man, you see. For all these reasons, thinking less and less, uh, drugging himself, tired, weary, exhausted, feeling it's all hopeless. And at once he becomes the victim of what is called the cult of personality. Haven't you noticed it? 
the excitement and the raving about certain performers who come to this country? Have you noticed? People become hysterical. They crowd to meet them at the stations. They crowd to have a look at them. They'll stand all night. Why? Well, because this personality has been built up. They don't know anything about him. They haven't thought. But this picture has been presented and they become victims. Anything to get escape, anything to get away from life and its humdrum activities, the cult of personality. And it's working in many, many different realms, not only in the entertainment realm, but in many other realms, some of them which you wouldn't even suspect, but it's been happening in the last six to seven years. Personality is built up and people fall and are amazed and they don't know what they're doing. And above all, of course, lies this terrible, horrible danger of a dictatorship, of saying very well, if that man claims he's got a system that he can do it, it would at any rate be as good as this, if not better, and so you go into it without knowing what's happening. Now then, all I've been saying so far is not at all specifically Christian. All I've been saying is something that is being said very eloquently by certain acute non-Christian thinkers. There are men today who are not Christian at all, who are grievously troubled about the future of the human race. They can see us returning to a condition of slavery because of the things that I've been enumerating to you. Well, now then, there is the, the case. There are the facts. Here comes the important question. What is to be done about it all? That's the question. That is the fact. What's to be done about it? I've already given my answer. There is only one hope. And it is this Christian message which comes to us and says, gird up the lines of your mind. But, says someone, this is really monstrous and ridiculous. Why, says the man, I gave up Christianity and going to a place of worship because I wanted freedom of the mind and freedom of thought. That's exactly why I have ceased to have any interest in Christianity. Your Christianity, they say, is that which has been keeping the human race down throughout the centuries. It's been the dope of the people. It's been this sub stuff. Why, says the man, you have the impertinence to stand there and say that Christianity alone guarantees freedom of the mind. And the fact is that nothing has so inhibited free thinking. Nothing has been such a drag upon the use of the brain and the mind and the understanding as you are Christianity. Now, that has been the case, isn't it? That is the popular case against Christianity. That is what a man like Karl Marx, for instance, the originator of communism, said about a hundred years ago. What have I to say to all this? Now, my friends, there is about this something which really is laughable, if it were not tragic. But it's tragic. Look at that man Karl Marx, the originator of communism. What did he... Well, what he said about Christianity is just what I've been repeating to you. And he exhorted people, and he does still through his works, to have nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with Christianity. Why? In order that their minds may be free. And it is in terms of that that Russia and other countries have become communist, and they're godless and atheistical. In terms, they say, of freedom of the mind. That's the claim. But what happens in practice? Well, I've already told you. Brainwashing. This is what communism leads to, you see. This is what is being done by the people who say that they give up Christianity and have no use for it because it doesn't allow freedom of the mind. What do they do with you? If you don't agree with them, well, they'll put you into a cell. And as I say, they'll give you insufficient food, they'll stop your sleeping, they'll put this blazing light on top of you, and they'll send in their interrogators one after another, and their indoctrinators, and they'll keep on doing it until you collapse physically, in sheer exhaustion, and not knowing what you're doing, you believe their teaching. Is that freedom of the mind? You say, oh, they say, you know, that Christianity of yours, it's like opium. It's the opiate of the people. 
It drugs you. It gives, tells you these wonderful stories about pie in the sky and it lulls you to sleep and thereby you don't think and you put up with the, the, the errors of the capitalists and their horrors. And that's why the, the people have been as they've been so long. What you need is freedom of the mind. And then you turn to them and what do they do? They take hold of a bludgeon and they hit you on your head until you're unconscious in various ways. I don't know what you feel. But if I had to choose between being struck and bludgeoned and taking opium, I'd sooner have the opium. But this isn't opium as I'm going to show you. But can't you see how monstrous it is? There are young people in this country today by the thousand who are ridiculing Christianity in the name of the freedom of the mind. And they say, oh, that other idea, this dialectical idea of Marx, there's something in it. Religion has been a dope of the people. Let's be free in our thinking. And that's what it leads you to. The greatest menace to the freedom of the mind, perhaps in the world at this very moment. And it's the same with the others. At the same time as Karl Marx was teaching that, Charles Darwin was propagating his theories about man and about his origin and about his development. And he again thought he was liberating men. He thought he was delivering men from the incubus of the Bible and all its teaching. He was putting men upon his feet. And enabling him to think truly. What has it led to? Well, it's been exactly the same once more. Men and women accepting the theory and believing that they're nothing but animals are behaving like animals. And after a hundred years of Darwinism, as I've shown you, people are thinking and reading less than ever. And have a baser conception of human nature than they've had throughout the running centuries. It's the same with science. Science came along and said... Get rid of your religion. Get facts. Think and meditate about these. Science, has this given us freedom? Why I say its main effect is that we're all so bewildered and baffled and amazed. We boggle at these terms and categories and ideas. We don't know where we are. And because of the immensity of our scientific knowledge, we've stopped thinking and have abandoned ourselves to the experts. Never, I say, has men thought less than he is doing at the present time. But then there are others, you see, who say, ah, what is needed is not religion, it's education, it's knowledge. Not of necessity, perhaps, they say, scientific or biological or political knowledge, but philosophical knowledge. That's what we need, education. But what has all our education led to? Why don't we face the facts, my friends? Here, I say, is a generation that has had the most amazing educational facilities that any generation has ever had. And yet our librarians are telling us, as I've told you, that people are reading less than ever, thinking in a tabloid manner, not really troubling even to read the news properly, living on pleasure and entertainment and not using their minds. That is what everything else has led to. And I say that this is utterly pathetic. That is what it has brought us to. And if you turn to it for any hope for the future, it has none whatsoever to give us. Your Marxist philosophy goes on in the same way. Your science and your biology go on in the same way. And your education goes on in the same way. I have read nothing so completely hopeless and pathetic for many a long year as what I read the other day. Some director of education was addressing a most learned conference of educationalists and he said the most urgent task confronting us at the moment is to educate people for freedom. But we've been doing that for a hundred years. Look at the acts of parliament we've passed. Look at all the education we've got. And the more we seem to do all this, the more the slavery falls down upon us. And the more we're in an utter captivity, and especially in the realm of our minds. No, no, everything else is bankrupt. For a hundred years, everything else has been given a thorough opportunity. It isn't as if it hadn't had an opportunity, it has. People have turned their backs on Christianity, seeking freedom of mind and freedom of thought. But the more they've gone away from this in all these other directions, the more it has produced acutely this great problem, the battle for the mind. And the high priests of these other cults and notions, such as H.G. Wells and the Huxleys and others, are the people who are most alarmed at this moment. 
about this horrible, terrible prospect of universal slavery of the mind of the whole human race. There is the position. So I come back and I say once more, there is no hope but this. It is literally the only thing that guarantees that a man will be free in the realm of his mind. It is the only thing that rarely and truly says, gird up the lines of your mind. But, says somebody, isn't the whole history of your Christianity and conversions the exact opposite of that? Isn't your conversion process but another example of a kind of brainwashing? Well, there are thousands of answers to that. I have no time to go into it this evening. Let me just hurriedly say this in passing. You know, the Bible disproves that very simply in this way. It tells you that the Apostle Paul went to Rome and he preached to a number of people. They were in the same service. It was the same preacher. They heard the same things. Yet I'm told some believed, some did not believe. There's no compulsion here. There is no forcing here. There is no reducing a man's resistance by physical means and others. There is this same division. The Old Testament tells us that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In spite of what was happening to him, in spite of what was being said to him, his heart was hardened. He was not reduced to a position of helplessness and of hopelessness. And it's been the same ever since. You see, brainwashing requires time. You can't brainwash a man in one session. You have to go on and on and on. Its great characteristic is repetition. You exhaust him and you go on repeating the same, same, same message. And at last he's exhausted. But what is the record of Christianity? It's this. A man comes into a service for the first time in his life. He wasn't a Christian. He ridiculed Christianity. He didn't believe in God. He was living a worldly, sinful life. He comes into a service and there and then, first time, he's converted. You see, it's the exact opposite of brainwashing. And the whole phenomenon of revivals proves exactly the same thing. So I dismiss that objection to the case for Christianity. Very well then, let me look at it more positively as I bring this to a close. What right have I to stand here and to say that this and this alone sets men's minds free? Well, my first answer is this, that the history of the human race proves that beyond a doubt and a peradventure. The most liberating force from the standpoint of the mind that the world has ever known has been Christianity. Listen, go back to the first century and you see a new phenomenon. Before Christ came into this world, there were the Greek philosophers, and they taught. Yes, but who did they teach? Oh, learned people like themselves. You couldn't listen to the Greek philosophers unless you'd got a brain and a certain amount of understanding. They had nothing to say to the poor. What's the great characteristic of this gospel preached by the Son of God? Here it is. The common people heard him gladly. Indeed, it was brought as a charge against him. Oh, they said, look at this rabble that's following him. The common people. Yes, but you see, this is why. Here at last is something that can make an ordinary person think. It's awakened his mind. It's set him free. Unto the poor is the gospel preached. Who were the first Christians? Well, the Apostle Paul reminds the members of the church at Corinth. He says, you see, you're calling, brethren... How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, and God hath chosen the base and ignorant things, even the things that are not, to confound the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The first Christians were slaves and servants, the slaves in Caesar's household, the soldiers, the ordinary people. The people that had been ignored and despised by the philosophers and the statesmen at last are confronted by something that awakens their minds. To whom were these mighty New Testament epistles written? These were not written to cardinals and great doctors of the church. They were written to the ordinary church members. These people were slaves and servants and soldiers. 
They must have had minds, therefore. What gave it them? The gospel that set them free opened their minds to receive such amazing truth. That's the story, and it goes on the same throughout the running centuries. Have you read of the dark Middle Ages? And how the masses of the people lived in ignorance. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't understand. Services were conducted in Latin and they didn't know what was happening nor what was taking place. Then suddenly there came what is called the Protestant Reformation. And what did it do? Well, it opened the, uh, the minds of men. It was the thing that led to the open Bible. It was the thing that gave a desire to people to read and to understand and to learn. The gospel has always liberated the minds of men. Come along the next century, the Puritan era. And there again you find the same thing. In Cromwell's army there were preachers. These men wanted to be kept abreast with the truth. They wanted their minds to be fed. The common people became knowledgeable and religious. Their whole level was raised. It was the gospel that did it. It's always done it. It did it in the next century, in the time of the evangelical awakening. Did you know that your modern educational movement comes out of that? It was because those poor, ignorant, besotted, drunken miners around Bristol and the, and the Midlands became saved and Christian that they desired to read the word of God. They didn't know they had a mind before, but being saved, becoming Christians, they realized they've got a mind and they want to develop it. They cried for schools and for instruction. Your trade union movement came out of the same revival. All the liberating, ennobling, uplifting movements in this land have come out of religious revivals, proving that the gospel always urges men to gird up the loins of their mind while everything else is drugging us and making us stop thinking and turning us into slaves and serfs. This, and this alone, is always urging us to gird up the loins of our mind. Why does it do this? Oh, I'll tell you why it does it. It does it, you see, because it's not a mere teaching. It is primarily a record of historical facts. And when a man cannot follow the subtleties of intellectual and philosophical argumentation and the dialectic of the schools, he can look at facts. Thank God the gospel is based upon historic facts. There are many of us who cannot follow the argument about the ultimate and the absolute. We can't grapple with abstract truths and concepts. But when I'm asked to look at a person, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who worked as a carpenter, I don't care how illiterate and how ignoble I am, I can look at him, I can listen. Here is a record of facts. The Old Testament is a great book of history. What God has done, God's activity in this world. Though I can't follow the refinements of philosophy, I can understand the flood and what it means, the crossing of the Red Sea. I can understand a man like Abram. I can understand the nation going down to Egypt, coming out. All these things are facts. And as I say, I can look at Jesus of Nazareth, this unique person that has come into the realm of history, I hear his teaching, I see him dying, I see them burying him, I see him appearing, I see what he's done, Pentecost, something happened, church comes into being, what is this? And I'm made to think, I'm looking at facts, and I want to have an understanding of them. And it's the same with all the subsequent history of the Christian message, the Christian faith, and the Christian church. My friends, the facts are before you. You're not just asked to accept a teaching or to do something that everybody else is doing. No, no, I stand here to say that when the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, 1959 years ago. That happened. Have you faced it? Have you considered it? That's all I'm asking. It isn't a subtle philosophy of teaching. It is primarily our being confronted by facts. But, oh, let me say this also. This and this alone guarantees uh, freedom of the mind and freedom of thought. Because this alone gives us a true view of man. If I'm but an animal, 
and I'm just in this world to eat and to drink and to indulge my sex? Well, why bother myself about thinking and about improving myself for the whole of the human race? Let's get as much as we can out of it while we're here. We'll soon enough be dead. That's the argument, you see, and it's the negation of thought. And that is what the modern views of men inevitably and invariably lead to. Their conception of man is so debased, it's so unworthy. I'm not surprised that people are not thinking. Oh, it's here and here alone that you rarely get a true view and conception of man. When I behold the heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars which thou hast made, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Here's man. Man is not an animal, my dear friend. You are not an animal. Man is a being that has been made in the image of God. He is a special creation. He is a unique creation. And his uniqueness lies very largely in his possession of this power of reason, this power of self-contemplation, this power of self-analysis and self-criticism, which no animal is capable of. That's the thing that makes a man man. Why? Well, God has endowed him with it. He made him upright. He made him like himself in this respect. That's man, a responsible creature under God not a mere resultant of ductless glands, not a mere conglomeration of instincts and desires and hereditary forces and factors. No, no, but a man responsible before God with these great powers and faculties and propensities. Well, then, you say, if that is true, why is the world as it is? And why is man as he is? And the Bible gives you the answer. It's due to this. Man, instead of functioning as he was made and as God meant him to do in his unutterable folly, listen to the devil, the enemy of God and of men, and in so doing he became the slave of the devil. He lost his freedom. He lost his freedom of thinking. He's become the slave of the devil, the God of this world. If our gospel be hid, says Paul, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You see, the devil's been doing it from the dawn of history. All that I've been talking about are but refinements of his original method. Communism and all the others are but particular manifestations. It's the devil at the back of it all, bludgeoning the minds of men, preventing their thinking, not allowing them to think, and turning them into his slaves. And thus they become the creatures of their own lusts of the flesh and of the mind and are slaves of the world and its outlook and its way of behaving itself. Oh, there's only one way of liberty. It is to realize what man is. That we are not meant to be as we are. That God made us for himself and meant us to be so different. But it not only gives us a right and a true view of men. It gives us a right and a true view of our life in this world and of our destiny. Dust thou art, to dust returnest. Was not spoken of the soul. No, no, a man is not an animal, he's not a mere mechanism. Death is not the end. There is that within us called the soul and it goes on to all eternity. And nothing can prevent that. We go on out of this life to another life that is to come. And you know, the moment I realize that, I begin to think. If I say this is the only life and the only world, well, it doesn't matter very much what I do in it. So I stop thinking and let myself go and satisfy my lusts. But when I realize that I am responsible and that it is appointed unto all men once to die and after death the judgment, automatically I begin to think. I begin to ask questions. I begin to reason. I want to know how can I be delivered out of this bondage in which I find myself. And again, this and this alone has the only answer to the question. It has the only hope to offer this evening. How can I be delivered? How can my mind be set free? How can I really think about self, life, death, God, eternity, and all that is. How can I? 
I realize I'm a slave. Try as I will, I can't emancipate myself. But here is the answer. God so loved the world that he gave, he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here is the light I need. Here is the truth I've longed for. But how can I believe it? How can I live it? How can I practice it? Thank God it goes on giving me an answer. It tells me that I can be born again. Did you notice it in the reading? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I need a new nature, because by nature I hate the light and I love the darkness. And I must have a new nature if I am to love the light and to hate the darkness. I'm offered it. I need strength and power. I need to be able to resist temptation and the devil and all these forces that are against me. I cannot. I need power. I'm given it. The Holy Spirit will dwell within me. Christ says I will come and I will take up my abode in you so that having him I'm able to say I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. Everything I need is provided here. I can't liberate my mind, but Christ can. He's done it. Look at the men he did it to, as depicted in the New Testament. Read the story of the saints and the, and the anchorites and the martyrs and all those who have come and found themselves in him as the result of believing the gospel. And invariably you will be looking at men whose minds have been liberated, who have been girding up the loins of their mind and thinking, and meditating, and living accordingly, and have become the greatest benefactors that the human race has ever known. My dear friend, this is the only way to have freedom for the mind. Face the facts. Every teaching that denies and denounces this enslaves the mind, ultimately. I think I've proved it to you. This, throughout the centuries, has set men free, opened their minds, created their idea, their idea within them of uplift and development and living a full life. And thank God, it is still able to do it. Have you thought about life? Have you thought about death? Have you thought about eternity? You know, it's no use talking to me about your great mind and freedom of thinking if you haven't faced those obvious first questions. Have you done so? Have you got the answer? Do you know what you really are as a human being? Do you know the true great greatness and dignity of man? Have you seen yourself as a pilgrim of eternity? Are you ready to meet the last enemy? Are you ready for what happens beyond when you stand before God in the judgment? Have you thought about, have you faced them? That's what the mind does. That's what Peter is exhorting these people to do. Have you done it? If you haven't, well then I say you're a hopeless slave to sin and the world and the devil. Awaken. Awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Ere it is too late, awake. Begin to think, reason, face it. Ask him to have mercy upon you, to enlighten you, to deliver you. You ask him seriously and sincerely. And he will do it. For he has so loved you that he's even died for you and for your sins. He died to set us free. To enable us to think 
and to be worthy of the name of men, to become children of God. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.